Please note that our spooktacular covers the haunted history of Bobby Mackey's music world, which includes grisly descriptions of past events. This is not an episode for young ears or sensitive stomachs. Previously on Hometown Haunts, 100th episode spooktacular. The 1860s, the first ghost story is from Gallows Gap. The infamous slaughterhouse was a non-commercial curing shed. Instead, the George W. Robertson Jr. and Company Distillery sat on the property for 43 years. The infamous tunnels are their old intake tunnels for whiskey production. In 1892, the 11th Street Bridge collapses, killing 41 men and teens. January 31st, 1896 was the brutal murder and beheading of 22-year-old Pearl Bryant. Her head was never found. Her killers are not known Satanists. The Bluegrass Inn, the Prim Primrose Country Club, and the Latin Quarter were grounds for prohibition of booze, illegal gambling, and run by notorious characters, followed by the Cleveland Floor, Four, a bunch of mobsters, up until the 1970s. Many brutal beatings and shootings occurred on the property, such as the 1943 beating of Paul Goodhue in the men's bathroom, the 1977 shooting of Richard Tonys, and the 1978 shooting of Dan Grow outside the building. In 1978, Bobby and Janet Mackey purchased the property, and strange things occur. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of our Hometown Haunts 100th episode, Spooktacular. I'm your host, Kat Cloco, and along with me on this ride into the supernatural stra strangeness that is our world are my friends, Christina Wald and Jen Kohler. Hey. Here I go. <clears throat> oh, excuse Hi. me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. And, and this time, we all have our celebratory hats on. Yay! And, Yay! and somehow, Jen is from the future. Or the past. Yeah, Jen is or Tron. I, I feel like <laughs> it is very Tron. I feel like we're in the movie Tron now. I think I got yeah. these at Horror Nights. Oh. Or you know, I can't remember. It was some on my Florida trip a couple years ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. Very like, Miami. Yes, went. <laughs> it's kind of like Miami Vice, um, you know. What was the, the, the guy that his head was in the TV and he would talk? Max? Something Max? Max Headroom. Max yes, Max. this is what these remind me of. Well, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Bit. It's Miami Vice Max Headroom. Yes. Yeah. Although yeah. it's very hard to uh, see. Oh, you don't need to see. <laughs> Just listen. Well, this is pretty warm, and my <laughs> basement's pretty cold. So my hat and it has birthday candles on it. Mm -hmm. I'll probably stay on, but I can take it off. Because we're going to talk about ghosts this time. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we couldn't make it to 100 episodes without the support of all of you listeners. We are continuing to cover the most requested location by you, the listeners, Bobby Mackey's Music World in Wilder, Kentucky. There is so much history to cover uh, and that has happened here that has taken us two full episodes to cover it all. This is episode number two. Plus, we have your ghost stories to share as well. So if you were mad at us about the first episode, not really talking about the ghosts, I'm sorry. There was just so much history there. Wow. I wasn't expecting it. So shall we Shall we start? Yes. All right. So I just did the previously on. So to catch up. Bobby Mackey has made comments that even before owning the property, he was drawn to it as a younger man. He would pass by the building when he, when it was the Latin Quarter, see all the cars lined up along the road and in the parking lot, and wonder what it was like inside, because it was just so freaking popular back then when the mob ran it. When he got the chance to purchase the property, he did. He was super excited by all accounts, and he sank his savings into it. The paranormal activity started to perk up when the couple, he and Janet, cleaned up the old building. Janet, who was also pregnant at the time with their second child, was getting creeped out around the building. Carl Lawson came on to help as a handyman with preparations for the new country music and nightclub. 
having previous experience at the Hard Rock Cafe, or as we really agree, it should have been called the Bloody Bucket. While sweeping in the old casino room, Janet was struck by a chill and the feeling of arms wrapping around her. A quiet, indistinguishable whisper filled her ears. A ladder began walking itself across the room, nearly falling on her before Carl moved her out of harm's way. In another incident, Janet was grabbed yet again by unseen forces in the old kitchen area while Carl was with her. They could hear evil laughing as pots and pans started rattling and then ripping away from the places and shot across the kitchen. Both Janet and Carl got out of the room unhurt but stunned. In yet another instance, and much more startling than the other two, Janet was grabbed by the waist and pulled up into the air before being flung down the staircase leading to the second floor apartment. As she states in a 1991 interview on Jerry Springer, I was upstairs checking around, making sure everything was, you know, getting prepared to open as something grabbed me around the waist. It was so much pressure and force that I could not get loose. So I was picked up and carried almost to the door where you go down the stairs and dropped on the floor. And then I got loose from it somehow and went on to the top of the stairs and fell down again. It was trying. I was trying to scream out, but I couldn't. She goes on to say, I was at the bottom and on my knees when I heard a voice say, get out, get out. That is pretty spooky to be thrown down a staircase, basically. I was going to say that. Now, have you, as in your ghost hunts and stuff, is that seems really unusual. I mean, is the, do you, what do you, I mean, are you skeptical about this or? It sounds, so this instance happened in 1973. And the only other incidents like it that I could think of were first the entity case mm-hmm. and then the exorcist case and anything Ed and Lorraine had their hands on. Yeah. Which ironically at this time were also big blockbusters and New York best time book sell- yes. sales. Like the exorcist, the movie came out in 73, I believe. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I don't want to doubt her because she's not here to defend herself anymore. So no. I don't want to sit there and say, this is all a lie. And the same with Carl. Both of them have since passed away. No. So I can't really say without, they're, they're not here. I can't. Yes. Yeah. But uh, it sounds suspicious. I can see why people would be questioning what happened because of the time it sounds like a haunting of the time which was something that i was uh, talking about or hinting at the last episode the hauntings change through the decades Mm -hmm. depending on what media is consuming it and reporting on it so these first incidences are following the exorcist and ed and lorraine warren stories Mm -hmm. and the investigations being done by um like Duke University and the psycho- parapsychology lab. And these, these just sound like that. It, they That's remind me thinking. of the stories of, um, they're always little girls about 12 years old being thrown around the house. And there was a couple in England, I think during this. Yeah. Time. The infield poltergeist. Yes. This yes. is what that and it is. All like the of. infield. Yeah, yeah. Infield case. Exactly. And, when did uh, Abbottville Horror come out? Was that 70s or was that a little later? I thought it was in the late 70s. Wait, so it was all... late 77 or 78, I want to say. Yeah, because yeah. there is a huge glut of mm-hmm. the paranormal dark occult starting with um, Rosemary's Baby in 68. Yeah, mm-hmm. And people just ate it up. And this also slid into the um, satanic panic of the in late the 70s and 80s. So this is occurring when basically we're hearing daily updates about satanic cults killing people. Um, We have it in our media with horror movies. It is in everyone's brains right now. And the marketing for the exorcist exorcist was brilliant because they're like, people are passing out. Ambulances are on standby. You'll oh, be yeah. so shocked at this. Everybody was scandalized by it. And mm-hmm. that just sent things flying. <laughs> and then you also had Poltergeist where you had really strange things happening to the cast members after the movie. Even with mm-hmm. the main uh, 
uh, actress passing away after I think it was Poltergeist 3. And yeah. that also builds up a lot of it. So like yeah. I said, she neither one of these people are here to defend themselves. They have had many interviews. They swear this happened. Yeah. So we'll work um, with that. Quick note on the poltergeist thing. There's a good uh, Netflix documentary on it. I can't remember the name of it, um, but it it talks about these stories around these movies. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's a couple for Rosemary's Baby too. Mm -hmm. But as for the the main actress, the little girl that died, she uh, she was basically misdiagnosed and was treated for the wrong. Yeah, thing. it was terrible. Yeah. I'm not blaming her. the paranormal. On no, 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 no. I just wanted. <laughs> Just say that because I, I didn't know the story behind it like truly until I, because they interview mm -hmm. like the director of the movies and the people that were actually there during the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was a super untimely death for her, I and know. it makes me sad whenever I see any of those listicles saying the fantastic things that happen on Poltergeist or the other yeah. horror movies from that classic genre. Yeah, and mm -hmm. also there were. A, ton of terrible horror movies made at that time and a lot of them focused on witches and satanic cults a mm -hmm. lot of them were nude and dancing around and like crush it never gets old. yeah oh you always want to see naked ladies dan dancing around a, a fire in the moonlight in the woods yeah so <laughs> keep this environment in mind while listening to the stories do. it's just context actually just cultural yeah. context of the zeitgeist of North mm -hmm. America at the time. Um, let's see. The experience forced Janet to into premature labor, delivering her daughter three months early the following day. The baby survived, I'm happy to say, and now is grown and has a family of her own. So mm -hmm. that Yay. note doesn't get mentioned a lot. People talk about, especially for the Ghost Hunters episode, uh, mm -hmm. they talk about there is a malevolent ghost that likes to pick on women and there tends to be the uh, pattern of five month pregnant women coming to the uh, Bobby Mackey's and then just being pest poltergeist pestered the entire time. Hmm. And they talk about the experience of Janet falling down the stairs and they always fail to mention that the baby was born premature, but survived. Because the way that the media makes it sound like is that she lost the child. And in fact, it was her second daughter. So <laughs> I just want to put that footnote as a parent. Baby is okay. So shortly before opening the nightclub, after this entire situation, a fire broke out and destroyed a wing of the building that formerly housed staff and held a private poker room. The cause of the fire was never determined. Oh wow. This place kept going up in smoke. Yeah. <laughs> Just this is at least the fourth fire that we've had well, in this it, property. I, I suppose in the 70s people smoked so much. I mean, I could see who's <laughs> probably that we will talk this. about. Mm -hmm. But yes, they smoked a lot. Oh, so much. So oh and gosh. I'm sure it was all um Tobacco? Asbestos, asbestos uh yes. Covered. So <laughs> the building was built in the early 1920s. Um, yeah, there's asbestos everywhere in that place. <laughs> and lead. It's just... Oh, wonderful. Pleasant. So, uh, September 1978, Bobby Mackey's Music World opens to the public. After the club opened, Carl moved into the apartment upstairs and worked as a caretaker of the property. Although he had experiences before living on the property, sent the paranormal experiences into overdrive. In one instance, he was standing at the main bar when he noticed movement out of his peripheral vision and was immediately frozen in fear. He saw the apparition of a young girl with short blonde hair appear before him. According to Carl, she was wearing a full-length gown that reached her ankles, and she said to him, My name is Pearl. I need your help. With quivering lips, he asked what kind of help she needed. Before she answered back, he could hear sinister laughter all around him. Then, out of nowhere, he got a blow against his jaw and a second hit his ribs before he fell to the floor in pain. He said that he felt an electric shock going through his body. When he awoke, he got to his feet, slowly making his way up, and heard gunshots ring out from the casino room. 
Entering the casino room to find the source of the sounds, he found nothing but silence. He turned to the bar to grab a bottle of holy water, which he had heard when he heard more popping sounds. Curious, he found the sounds were coming from a cactus decoration near the bar. Kneeling down to investigate, the cactus sprung apart, covering him with thousands of baby spiders. He ran out the door and into the river to wash them off. After catching his breath and getting his composure back, he returned inside to see that the cactus decoration was intact. You know, people were using a lot of LSD back then, too. Yeah. Uh, 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 no. But this does sound like something that you would have seen, like an Amityville horror or something. Like that. It it reads exactly like something. I keep thinking Enfield, but Amityville or Exorcist. I will note, I am a bit of a spider fan. Yeah. No spider, do that. No. The only kind of spiders that would be able to jump like that are all jumping spiders. And oh, they they're super going, cute. They're super cute. They're not going to mm -hmm. do jack to you. And mm -hmm. also, they see a giant human. They're going to go like on the bar or on the wall. They're not going to go on a person. Mm -hmm. So that entire imagery is very spooky. Very spooky. A plus for writing that one. Yeah. Um, that belongs like in. Do and like credits or something. You know, like, yeah. Well, it's, and it's, it's no very wonder. Exaggerated. It got the uh, uh, mouth of hell reputation. Yes, that's what and that sounds can, like. <laughs> we can talk about that in a bit, but we're still going through. This is we're we haven't reached the eighties yet. Nope. Everyone. <laughs> this is still was 1978. Watching, when everybody was watching all the, like you said, Rosemary's Baby and Exorcist. Yeah. You know what? I don't care if this is true or not. This is fun. It is very fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I had a hoot reading all the stories and Mike walked in on me when I was in the middle of watching Ghost Adventures and I had the stupidest smile on my face. <laughs> and he looked at me and he's like, you are having a lot of fun. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes this is yes. fun to watch. It's, it's, it's just, I'm enjoying myself. This is the best homework I've ever had to do. <laughs> well, those old Jerry Springers, I mean... Oh, I mean, yeah. it was a blast from the past. It was great. I watching everyone's bell bottoms and froze and lots of brown, so much brown. It was <laughs> everywhere. Shag carpeting. And yes, paneling. this is not the color of the eighties. No, no, well, this is the like, no. well, color of the eighties. That is yeah. nineteen eighty nine, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, this is, but this is, this is this, yeah, this is, you're you're like a nagel painting, you know, territory. Everything is wood. <laughs> Everything is there. There is a country revival going on right now. Yeah, so right. going back, but, to this, but we digress. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Carl also claimed to have an encounter with the ghost of Joanna, and that she told him to dig in the basement and look for a tunnel. After working away on the floor with a pickaxe, he found a sealed tunnel. Continuing to excavate the tunnel, he reportedly found a few pieces of paper that read, My name is Joanna, and I beg you to help me. I'm a prisoner in hell. Search for in the spotlight room. Going upstairs, he ventured to the spotlight room, not easy to get to from the main floor. He had to break open a door to the old catwalk, and no one had been in there in ages. There he found some old artifacts of Joanna's and her journal. Also, a poem on the wall was written by, reportedly written by Joanna. It's in the wall of the spotlight room. So, I accidentally put away my book. <laughs> I will read to you the excerpt that was uh, written. It, Carl apparently rewrote some of the important stories from the journal and these are the excerpts that we have the journal of course does not exist anymore it has been lost to time of mm. course so, um basically the lyrics on the wall of the spot room read the world may disappear like a castle of sand but i'll be waiting here with my heart in my hand my love i love you so much now and forever you ask me when 
when will I die? I tell you never. My heart cries out from hell. I will be waiting here. My love is, I tell you never. Which is a very spooky poem to find yeah. written, handwritten on a wall. Um, and I will also note that it's very difficult to read this with red lighting behind me. <laughs> um, I, was just, I was just thinking, I felt like I was listening to some Yacht Rock again. <laughs> There's something fun about that. So that particular poem... I, I'm, I guess I'm going to get ahead of myself is actually lyrics from Never in the 1951 film The Golden Girl, sung by Lionel Newman and Elliot Daniels. Uh, <laughs> the My Heart and Hell bit is changed from the original refrain. So uh, somebody that, was that, writing the lyrics down. Somebody was writing the lyrics down. Some other fun point is that this particular song was not actually recorded until 1952 and pressed onto records. Hmm. Why this is important is now we know a roughly the time that this could have been written on the wall. It had to be post 1952. So hmm. just a cat being a sleuth again with time. Mm. Um, let's see. Do we know who Johan Joanna Anna was? Johanna, we're Johanna. getting there. Jen? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Stop asking questions. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'll shut up. Watch the movie and shut up. <laughs> My bug was better. Um. All right. No, we're not punchy at all. Um. So this is this is an excerpt from the actual journal that um that uh, Carl transcribed. So Joanna writes, today is Tuesday. My father and I have had another argument. He told me to stay away from Robert, Joanna's boyfriend. Um, he said this would be his final warning. I don't know what I'm going to do. He said he would kill him. I would rather be dead than without Robert. It's after seven in the evening and I'm sick to my stomach. Oh, yes, that I, I'm sorry. Um, I think. Yes, no, this is fine. Uh, okay, I'm sick to my stomach. I've been vomiting every day for at least a week. I forgot where I was. I know that what's wrong with me. I'm pregnant with Robert's child. If my father finds out, he'll kill me. Robert and I are going to sneak off together soon. We're going to Chicago where Robert has a friend who is a talent agent. He's going to get Robert a job singing in, in an all-night cabaret and help me pursue help him pursue his singing career. We are going to get a small flat and Robert is going to sing six nights a week. I don't want to keep dancing as a chorus girl. I need to find an easier job being pregnant. It won't take any, I won't take any chances. We have to be careful not to let my father know where we're going. He, he would hunt us down and kill us both. Uh, he's insane. My father would do anything to keep me from Robert. He said that Robert Randall was no a no count bum. He always calls him by his full name. I call him by his pet name. I gave him Robbie. He laughs at me when I do this. We love each other so much. Mm. Continues on. It's Friday. Now Robbie and I are going to sneak off after he sings his last song tonight. I have everything packed for our trip. I can't wait to get out of here. I want to get as far away from my father as possible. I can't believe the day has finally come for me to escape his cruelty. So, uh, Carl continued reading the page of this diary and turning the page. The handwriting apparently went from very be, being very nice and neat to being almost a collection of squiggles, as uh, Dan Smith writes. Um, and also smear marks, as if somebody was crying while writing. Hmm. I went to Robbie's dressing room and knocked over and over. No one answered, so I turned the doorknob and walked inside. He wasn't there. The blue shirt he had been wearing was on the floor, ripped all the way up the back. I, it was covered in blood. I know my father has killed Robbie. He'll rot in hell for doing this. I don't know what to do. We were getting out of here. I never, never leave now. I'll kill my father and myself. I don't have a life without Robbie. This child inside me has no future without her daddy. I know it's a girl. I'm going to kill my father. He's a rotten paid killer. And... He and Red have shot three or four men that I know of. They killed Tony in here two weeks ago. 
over a lousy gambling debt. Which is interesting because now it's mentioning Red, who mm -hmm. used to manage the place. They took Tony's body down to the basement and carried him through the tunnel to the river. They don't think I know about the tunnel. They use it to bring illegal moonshine into this place, which is true. That's what they did. Uh, kind Well, during the um, country club years and when it was the blue grass in. Anyway. They use it to bring illegal moonshine into this place. They think everyone is stupid. They get their bootleg whiskey sent here by boat up the Licking River. I can't believe they haven't been caught all the times they have docked the boat and carried off stuff through the tunnel. Well, I'll see they get caught now. I'm going to write a letter to the government and tell them about the secret tunnel these fine upstanding men use at night. I'm going to tell them about the dead man that they hauled to the middle of the Ohio River and dumped overboard. I think they have buried some bodies in the basement. They filled in an old cistern with concrete instead of just covering it over. I wish Buck was still here. He was a kind man. My father had Red run him off. They forced him to sell this place to their boss. They would have killed him if he had continued refusing their demands. If I knew where Buck was, I would tell him everything I know about my father and his friends. I heard Buck tell my father he would return here someday and get revenge. Buck swore this place would never thrive as a gambling casino again. If there is justice, he'll return, and I'm sure hope he does i'm going to take poison and leave this life after i poison my father if there is a life after death i'll walk this place until robbie returns for me no so that is not the end it keeps going um it's sunday now so before it was friday and now it is sunday uh i don't have much time to write this down I did it. I poisoned my father. I sat at the kitchen table and watched him pour three cups of coffee. He drank every drop. He always drinks four or five cups in the morning. I, sorry, as a coffee drinker, all I can say is weakling. Um, <laughs> four or five cups. Like tiny eight ounce cups. What? Anyway, um, that's just me being judgmental. Sorry, everyone. Um... <laughs> Okay. Cat is uh, a coffee I, fiend. <laughs> I am quite a coffee fiend. Um, I drank a cup with him. We are both doomed. The poison is working on me. I can barely see to write this down. My eyes are blurred. I waited until he fell to the floor. I told him I poisoned him and he was going to rot in hell. He laughed and told me he had sold his soul to the devil and he would be here forever. He would be he would control me in death as he did in life. He told me that the well was used as a gateway to and from hell. I didn't understand what he was talking about. He said the well was a tunnel. He told me that they found a sealed up well and climbed to the bottom of it. It was used to drain animal blood into the river when the place was a slaughterhouse years ago. He and his friends dug from the bottom of the well toward the river, reopening the tunnel. He laughed at me and said he would return from hell. He said he would keep Robert from me for all eternity he said the devil appeared to him in the well and he sold his soul for immortality i'm gonna pause here for a second dramatic applause dramatic pause he will use the well to come back here I will not make a joke about the ring. I will not make a joke about the ring. I will not make a joke about the ring. He told me his friends would cover up our deaths just like they done before. No one will ever know we existed. He told me the well and the licking river were used for satanic ceremonies because it flows north just like the Nile River. That's not the worst of it. As my father lay on the floor dying, uh, the spirit this spirit came out of him and identified himself as Alonzo Walling. He mocked me saying it was he who entered my father's body and took control of him, making my father kill Robbie. The spirit laughed and told me he and his friend were hung for killing and beheading a girl named Pearl. The spirit of Alonzo said he would make all pregnant women who entered this place 
place pay with their lives. He said it was his pal Scott who actually killed the girl, but he too was hung for the crime. And because of that, all pregnant women will suffer his wrath. Don't we suffer enough? Anyway, seriously, he I'm said say, Pearl's really? head was. Hmm? I, I was going to say like, really? Yeah. I mean, that man has if never. If you don't stolen. want kids, there's yeah. ways you can prevent it. <laughs> no, I was about to say this man has never had swollen feet and had to walk in them. <laughs> mm -mm. Anyway, uh, he said Pearl's head was buried deep down in the well and that it was a blood sacrifice to Lucifer. I'm going down to the basement and pray over the tunnel in hopes that I can block the evil from coming here again. To whoever finds this book, please find a way to seal the well and keep my father and his friends in hell. You are my only hope, Obi-Wan. Oh, no. Um, not Obi-Wan. Um, <laughs> no, it is Obi-Wan. <laughs> I may have watched Star Wars a few too many times. You are my only hope. If my prayers don't work, I'll be his. Per I'll be in his prison forever, and many more people will suffer their evil wrath. I I'll never be with Robert again. If you ignore this, my father should be dead by now. My body is trembling from the poison. My mouth is so dry. I don't have much time left. It's funny. I thought I felt my baby move. It's raining outside. I can hear raindrops beating against the roof. I'm going to the basement and do what I can to stop my father and his evil. I'm taking the cover of this book and a few pages with me. If you have found this part of the diary, look in the basement for the other half. I'll try to write down what happens if I can. I'm looking at the words just I just wrote on the wall. Please, Robert, come back to me. The words make me want to cry. I have to go now or I won't have the strength to walk to the basement. I can't wait any longer. Please help me. I need your help. My love is so powerful. I'll find you a way to come back with me, Robbie. If you, whomever you are, will only help me. Please, I beg you to help me. If I fail, you must seal the well. And, um, Dan Smith goes on to write, The legend of the old tunnel being Hell's Gate was born from the journal that Carl found. He would soon face the dark entities in a showdown that would test his faith and everything he thought to be true. So that is the creation of Joanna. Hmm. And uh, I'm sorry I made jokes and editorialized. I try not to do that, but I could not help it. There were so many things from pop culture that, because the first the first Star Wars was in 1977. <laughs> Help me, Obi Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Famous <laughs> lines. Well, I was going to say this is very hyperbolic. Mm. It reminds me, and I'm I'm dating myself here. It reminds me of a live journal or zanga entry from the aughts, mm -hmm. written by. A 13 year old hmm. i know this because i was one of them <laughs> and read my friends and it, it just it struck me so much as just being a live journal post and also i know i am not a medical expert i am not i watch a lot of true crime shows that does not make me an expert <laughs> but the amount of writing she did after drinking a cup of poisoned coffee, and then the fact that she was able to climb up to the spotlight room, leave the diary there, walk, climb down the ladder to the spotlight room, walk down into the basement and into the well, and then die in the basement. That's a lot of effort. I do not know what kind of poison she took. Arsenic is generally the easiest available. Mm -hmm. Your guts would be out of you from the amount of vomiting if it was the actual volume that you would take. Generally, you want to poison someone over a long period of time with arsenic. Not that advice or anything, but um, it, it, to take like one giant shot of arsenic, one, you would taste it, unless that yeah. is some mighty strong coffee. And I don't think he, I don't think her dad would have gotten to five cups mm -mm. of that. It, it, the reason why I can talk about that is for my book, I wrote about the murders that Celie Rose did. 
and she killed her family over a long period of time by putting rat poison in basically their cottage cheese for their breakfasts. And she actually didn't dose enough to kill everyone on the first go. Mm -hmm. uh, she ended up having to kill uh, her brother. It took two to two doses and she never got her mother killed, I think was what it was. I may be confusing it with another case. But at the time, also, coroners knew what arsenic poisoning looked like. And when they would basically open you up to see your guts from your GI tract, your intestines and everything would be green. There'd be a lot of green bile. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. That's, that's why arsenic poisoning was particularly easy to figure out the cause of for such a long time is because and yet it, they have a hard time doing it now do they because mm -hmm. i know like is it trace amounts because maybe Celie dosed her family for so much because there was green bile everywhere well you know like a lot of obvious the true crime stories poisoning is women's me preferred method and people keep saying oh i've been sick for so many months i've been sick we just can't figure out what it is you know, mm -hmm. I get better when uh, a little when bit I'm not when I'm in the hospital, when I'm not around that person, but then it happens again. And then the person inevitably comes and feeds the victim in the hospital. And then it's like, test for that first. I don't know why they don't test for that first. <laughs> if you don't know what it is. a lot of other Ill illnesses. You know, true. It's just, it takes them a minute to get there. Yeah. But. And, uh... Yeah. Yeah, so the, of course there's so many different ways to poison yourself. I'm not going into that, but uh, we don't know. This is not a how-to podcast. Yeah, yeah, this is not a how-to <laughs> podcast. Um, so, at any rate, getting back. Carl Lawson also came face-to-face -face with terrible creatures, first in the basement and the second in on the stage. Lawson had poured holy water all over the tunnel in the basement in an attempt to please Joanna's ghost after uh, reading the diary he tried to basically seal the portal to hell with holy water he got from the local catholic church that was just down the road uh, things were quiet for a while until a day when he went to the basement and encountered a horrid creature that pointed a finger at him and screeched get out now the creature then grabbed him by the throat and slammed his body on the ground with tremendous force lawson got out and returned to the local catholic church and retrieved another bottle of holy water and he was basically filling Coke bottles with plastic Coke bottles with water. This wow. man's determined. Yes, he is. So returning <laughs> to the watch, bar. It hmm? sounds like he'd watch The Exorcist. Yeah. Everyone the watched water. The Exorcist. Well, I would be running in the other direction never to return. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Return. Uh, fun fact. I have actually never seen The Exorcist. As a movie. We can remedy that this weekend. No, we will not. Um, it, one, <laughs> where's the time? And two... There isn't time to watch a movie, really. Yeah, there isn't the time. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's just... I feel I feel bad for Linda Blair seeing the clips that I have of it. Oh, so. yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, returning to the bar, he encountered another creature, but this time with red glowing eyes entranced by the eyes he forgot the holy water as a chill passed through his body he became aware he was floating five feet off the ground then nothing when he came to he was standing but was filled with all sorts of evil emotions according to his Ooh. friends and co-workers his demeanor changed sometimes he was in control other times he would be aggressive and nasty unexpectedly he reported feeling like something was crawling under his skin now that's straight out of the exorcist like the glowing yeah. red eyes was that a thing before exorcist and like that was big in amityville horror remember that like they had the pig with the glowing red eyes yep um i'm trying to think back to more historic haunts and generally no there would be like okay what did have gro glowing red eyes would be hellhounds mm. And a lot of older English or at least British Isles stories that I can immediately think of. But I'm thinking of hellhounds immediately from the 1800s. 
Um, and maybe some other fey folk stories. Mm-hmm. But n- thinking about like other stories from other cultures, I'm not really getting red glowing eyes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, this paragraph you just read is like right out of The Exorcist. Okay. I mean, being slammed to the ground, red eyes, possession, like Catholic Church, holy water, like that's like was in all those things. Okay. Yeah. I'm familiar. A lot of the other paranormal movies of the time also featured those things. Yes. Um, yeah. It was just, yeah, it was a trope. Yeah. 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 Well, it sounds like he was possessed. Yeah. Or having a psychotic break. We'll we'll get to those points in a bit. <laughs> you you just keep your mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's I'm not reading like ahead. I swear. ahead. <laughs> okay. After so many stories from Carl and Janet, Bobby called Reverend Glenn Cole, who became convinced that Lawson was under dem- demonic oppression or possession. On August 8th, 1991, Reverend Cole performed a rite of exorcism on Lawson, ultimately freeing him of his demons after six hours. There is video footage of this. You can find it on YouTube. I have watched it. And? and? <laughs> um, Lots of voices are being said. Or, I mean, like, I do voices, but... um, And... I believe the demon's name was Charlie that they tended to talk to the most. Uh-huh. Um, watch it if you're interested. If you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. Um, there are people that believe that if you watch exorcisms, you could technically s- summon entities that are exercised. Mm. Um, I've also seen Ed and Lorraine's video. Lorraine Warren showed it to me of an exorcism they performed when they were working in the seventies, it was very similar to the one from what I remember of Carl Lawson's exorcisms are generally not as Hollywoody as you've seen. There's no floating. I don't recall any type of ectoplasm or green pea soup being vomited from anybody's orifices. Um, But there's lots of screaming. There is voices there writhing. is writhing, there's curling up, there is spitting on the religious person, there's much more terrible things that they could be doing to the people around them watching it. So your discretion watching the video, but it's out there if you would like to see it. And mind you, it is 1991, everything's poorly lit and looks yellow. So now here's the thing is is holy water only in catholic churches like is that only a no catholic thing? okay no i mean mm-hmm. i was raised catholic so i mean i have not experienced many other uh religious ceremonies yeah it's mm-hmm. if you go to now mind you most of my experiences are eastern so when you go into a shinto shrine and a lot of times they are coupled with a buddhist temple you go wash your hands with clean um, spring water. But in places like Kyomizudera in Kyoto, they have a fountain that you can drink from. And that's holy water, but it's not the same type as in you have a priest pray over it. Because it comes from a spring, it is blessed from the gods. Mm. So um, it's a different type of holy water but it's still can con- it's still consecrated ground you're drinking water on consecrated ground so um <laughs> though i do want to mind say when you go wash your hands when going into a shrine in a temple you do not drink the water in that you spit it out you're just supposed to put it in your mouth wash out your mouth and then you spit it onto gravel away from the rest of the tub of water so so it's like that like getting rid of your sins it's or kind of cleansing yourself cleansing yourself yeah before you, you, before you see the gods <laughs> and then you also can walk through and this is for buddhist temples um you walk through incense there are going to be gigantic urns of incense and ash and people will light um and then take out um basically sticks of incense and when you walk up to these urns and they're like the size of a cauldron you are supposed to put the um 
smoke onto you mm-hmm. and around you. And for certain festivals, you can bless things with smoke. And uh. um, this is also kind of to cleanse you. And it smells like sandalwood. It's super pleasant. Mm. And uh, yeah. Um, th- so those just going into a temple and sacred land, that's you're cleansing yourself twice, basically. Huh. Well, that sounds Wait. fascinating. Kind of cool. I, it's very comforting to me. It's like going home, but um, it, it we can talk about that for a different time. But yes, different cultures have holy water and uh, and used different ways. So hmm. in some cultures, there's milk that's used. So and yeah, it's all meant to cleanse you. All right. So there is a big warning sign when you walk into the front doors of Bobby Mackey's and it used to be a yellow handwritten sign. It has been transformed into a a new nice printed sign that they made that's white and hangs over the door, but it says the exact same thing. Warning to our patrons. This establishment is purported to be haunted with an underlined management is twice underlined, not responsible and cannot be held liable for any actions of the ghosts and or spirits on this premises. So with the, we'll hold up in court. (laughs) I just like, sorry, editor and me, when you double underline something that means it needs to be capitalized. (laughs) Well, it's all capital. It's all caps. It's all capital. The whole sign is all caps. It just reams us. Warning to our patrons! This <laughs> establishment is purported to be haunted like that. It, yeah. it's, it's no exclamation points, though. That is true. Points so for that. Don't sue us if you get thrown down the stairs or hurt. Basically, we are not reli- <laughs> We're not liable for anything that happens to you once well, you that cross seems this like threshold. The ghosts, did hmm? the ghosts keep throwing people down the stairs and grabbing their throats after this? We're we'll getting get there, that, Christina. <laughs> We're getting. Wait, there. Quit jumping I'm ahead, man. Slowly. <laughs> it's a story. <laughs> We're on a journey. Paranormal encounters now. Uh, the rite of exorcism did not dispel the hauntings and strange activity at Bobby Mackey's, though it seemed to help Carl a lot. There is a sign, like I just read, that is put on top of the door, uh, warning patrons that they are entering a haunted place. So the ghosts that are said to haunt a property. We have Joanna, said to haunt all over the property, but most often found in the dressing rooms. Full-bodied apparitions of her have been reported, as stated above by Carl Lawson. The smell of rose perfume, especially in the dressing rooms, are said to be a mark of Joanna. Then there's George, reported by Wanda Kay, former tour guide and staff at Bobby Mackey's. George torments females who step on the property. George is said to hate women and is the reason why ghost hunters were called to the property for their season seven episode. He is said to be encountered the most in the old apartment above the nightclub where Carl used to live and also in the bull room. There are shadow figures uh, that have been seen all over the property. There is a shadow figure with glowing white eyes who has been seen in the bull room witnessed sitting at a table uh, by various people author of Ghosts of Bobby Mackey's Music World, Dan Smith, even witnessed this specter with glowing white eyes and wearing an orange shirt. Smith later reported looking through Polaroids taken during the final years of the Latin Quarter to find a lounge singer wearing an orange shirt, shirt just like the one he had witnessed, flanked by dancers wearing bright green costumes. In the basement, various shadow people have been reported, some with or without red eyes. Ghost investigators have even run into an apparition of a thin man with short, dark hair and either with very light or white eyes. He pops up in front of them before disappearing and leaving the investigators rattled. Of course, there are other paranormal experiences reported by staff and guests. There are physical interactions such as being touched, women being stroked on the thighs. Ew, no. Yeah, I knew you were going to just (laughs) freak out, Jen. Mm -hmm. Women having their hair pulled being scratched, religious jewelry being messed with while in the presence of investigators, and arms being touched by unseen hands. Keep growling your hands to from yourself. <laughs> they're very handsy in the basement. Uh, growling from the jail room or room with faces. This was captured on film in an episode of Ghost Adventures, plus reported by paranormal investigators. There's unsettling feelings, objects moving, 
electrical electric voice phenomena, aka EVP. A notable one was captured saying yes and humming in the room of faces. This is thought to be the one of the spirits of a poor black man who met his fate at Gallows Gap. This is, I also will note, the only evidence that I have found of anyone from that era haunting the property, which I find fascinating because not a lot of people know about it. So getting that type of EVP out of nowhere is more intriguing to me than Carl being lifted up in the air. Hmm. Hitchhiking ghosts are encountered quite often, which means these are ghosts from the property that follow you home, unless you have directed them not to otherwise, but sometimes some people say they still follow them home, and disembodied voices. No one except Carl Lawson and Janet Mackey were ever picked up and thrown on the property. Hmm. See, I said we'd get to it. Um, In November 2023, it was announced that Bobby Mackey's Music World would be temporarily moving to Mugby's Biker Bar and Restaurant in Florence, Kentucky, starting December 1st, 2023. The reason stated by Mackey was that the original building, Sierra 1921, is in need of extensive renovations. So this is all the book history and countless hours of paranormal TV shows, news reels, any interview that I could find that I could reasonably listen to um, mentioned. I have put it together in the past two episodes. As I mentioned, um, Janet Mackey passed away. Uh, she passed away in 2009 uh, Carl Lawson passed away in 2012 oh. and Wanda Kay, I miss her so much. She passed away in 2017. She was a gem to talk to at a lot of the paranormal events I went to. She was a tour guide to many and uh, she seemed genuinely concerned about everyone who went to Bobby Mackey's. Oh. I am sad to see that three people that had extensive experiences there passed away rather early they were all in their 50s and in the case of janet i believe she was 60 so has bobby now, come out and said any of his experiences at all he has mentioned an experience of the day he walked in seeing a woman in a white dress besides that he says that janet and uh carl were making stories up between each other oh really he is he doesn't stop people from investigating, uh-huh. but, but he skeptical. himself seems to be pretty skeptical. Huh. But he doesn't okay. stop people. Okay. Um, and okay, well, publicity is good. I mean, it brings people in. I mean, he may yeah. not he he may debunk it, but he's not going to turn the money away. Right. I do want to point out a few things. One of them can tie back to my own experience at Bobby Mackey's. Um, there is some very real reasons why people are experiencing things when they go there. The first one and a very big one is allergens. And this one I personally have experience with. There is so much cigarette smoke. Think about over a hundred years, 103 years. That's how old this building is full of cigarette smoke. I'm sure cigar smoke too. Menthol. Mm. So, um, it, it's everywhere. It's in, it has seeped the entire building. And this is just my observations. The entire building is tobacco yellow. Every single wow. seat, every single yeah. bar, the wall panels, the ceiling panels, the bowl, everything is stained tobacco yellow. It's everywhere. As so everywhere is mold. Mold is everywhere in that basement. And it, it, People will say they'll go in there and immediately feel ill or after being there for about a half an hour, feel ill and want to fall, feel like they need to fall down or they're nauseous or they're getting headaches. My friends, my good friends, that is mold toxicity. <laughs> Get And then when they say they leave the premise, they immediately feel better. Yes, because you have walked outside where there's fresher air and you're no longer being slowly poisoned by the mold down there. In addition to that, there is dust everywhere. That basement is a mess. Anybody yeah. who goes in there to sees it's it's it, it looks like someone's garage. There's stuff everywhere. 
and uh, there's pieces of wood and you know what when you just have pieces of plywood and stuff stacked around you get mildew white powdery mildew everywhere and if you're allergic to mold that wreaks havoc on your system if you're down there long enough it will mess you up also there is a lot of unshielded wires and emf running amok in that building that was what ghost hunters found when they were there in 2011 this is reinforced by the unsolved team from buzzfeed finding wires just sticking up haphazardly I'm going to assume, since it was done in 1921, that you have cable Romex and knob and tube wiring somewhere in there that's super unshielded. It's just going to give off so much electro electromagnetic fields. And guess what? When you're exposed to that day in and day out, you start having hallucinations. This is one of the paranormal investigations I did back in 2011 it was a poor family whose toddler was seeing shadow people and it turned oh, out their bed was on the opposite side of the power box so when we moved oh, the bed wow. to the other side of the room they stopped seeing shadow people because they weren't in the emf field so, so you're saying bobby mackey's isn't really haunted i think it really is haunted okay but I don't think it's haunted by the things it's rumored to be haunted by. Gotcha. So um, I know, Jen, you've been there. Yes, I've only been once. I want once. to give my voice a break. Okay. So, Jen, please yeah. describe when you were there. So what was like? your, your experience? Uh, I can't remember. When, when did I? I can't remember when I went. It was some 2010s somewhere around there, maybe. Um. It did smell like an old smoky bar, stale beer kind of smell. Um, it's I was surprised at the size of it. Um, but I liked, and I think people were still smoking in there because you could still, it was still there. But the sounds of the building were cool, like the creaking floor. And um, that's I didn't, safe. Sorry. Well, it was, it's old. You know, it is. And then uh, I didn't realize the history of it. I kind of, when I went there, and I'm like, oh, I didn't know they had a ghost tour. So, of course, I went on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the first Monty time I ever. Clay probably was your tour guide. I can't remember who it was. I don't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't Bobby or anybody. No. No, it was, I don't know. Mm -hmm. First time I ever sang karaoke. Aww. and we were there early so it wasn't really full yet so when i went on the tour it started more and more people started to come in and there was live music upstairs and you could hear that coming through the floor and people dancing and moving around um thinking back on it i did, did feel uncomfortable in the basement but i don't know if that's just because i was and it's a ghost tour and i was kind of like <gasps> you know you were prepared to be freaked out mm -hmm. um yeah. And I, I know I've mentioned this before, but from the upstairs bar, they would throw empty beer bottles, I think, down a chute. And they would land yes. in big barrels. And, of course, they break. And the first time I heard that, I was like, what the hell? Is that? Yeah, that scares the <laughs> scares the ever-living crap out of me. You know, um, I think it was one of the dressing rooms, maybe. That I felt a little uncomfortable in. Mm -hmm. It was a small room. Had one little folding chair in there. And had a red light. And then yeah, of course the. Good. Mouth of hell. Wait a I'm in a room with a red light. In no it was just like one. Uh, red light bulb. Yeah. I know you what know, you mean. It was like being in a dark room. Honestly. Ah. Um, but I was standing in it while they were telling the stories. I'm like, I think I just want to step out of here because I'm feeling a little claustrophobic. Yeah. <laughs> but and then the mouth of hell kind of made me uncomfortable. But other than that, I mean, I didn't experience any touching or hair pulling or I'd be interested in going back now. And of course, now mm -hmm. we can't because it's in a different location. Yeah, it's closed right now. Yeah. And a, fr a friend of mine rolled, ro rode the bull. <laughs> oh my god she had fun and yeah. the guy the guy tried to get me up on there and i'm like i'm not getting up there so all my my bits and pieces can jiggle for you no thank yeah. you 
<laughs> now that's our quotable line. The mouth yeah. of hell made me uncomfortable. I want a t-shirt that yeah. says that. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it was fun. I mean, I haven't been back since, but you know, I'm not a big drinker. And right. well, you were legend tripping. You were able to go to a haunted location with other yeah. people where you could feel safe. So you could get your adrenaline pumping and then yeah. go home. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, back then, of course, still smoking in bars was allowed in Kentucky. And I hated smelling like cigarette smoke. I grew up with that. Mm -hmm. And by the time I moved out, I, you know, I became more sensitive to it. And, you know, growing up, I'm sure I smelled like cigarette smoke all the time. Didn't even realize it, mm -hmm. you know. And, um but yeah, I, when I walked in, the the lady running the karaoke booth was singing "Fancy." Oh, <laughs> and she had a really good voice. I was really excited. that just made me excited because I hadn't heard it in a while, and I grew up listening to Reba's version, Reba McIntyre's yeah. version. But the, I forgot to mention, and I'm pretty sure our <laughs> listeners who are more familiar with Bobby Mackey's probably are screaming at their radios or have turned us off by now. <laughs> one of the ghost stories is that the jukebox would play the anniversary waltz oh cool with or without being plugged in ah, Ooh, and this is an an encounter from an account from carl that he woke up one day and the jukebox was playing anniversary waltz he got down there unplugged it went back up and then he heard it again he would hmm. also claim that at 6 a.m. every morning, it sounded like an army of people would march through the building. That was definitely from um, Amityville Horror. Because they okay. had the marching band in the middle of the night. Oh, they did? All right. Yeah, yeah. It's I, you know, been a minute since I've seen these 70s movies. and 80s. Uh, the book, before the movie came out, the book, everybody was talking about it. Um, the 70s was a weird time. Mm, very. Uh, now, even though I was a kid, I mean, I remember the books, like the books Flowers in the Attic, which is a really weird book, was very popular. Amityville Horror was really popular. Oh, and I that incest going on reading, in the attic. My best friend was reading both of them. So I didn't read them, <laughs> but she read half of them to me. And so that's how I remember them rather clearly, like the Amityville Horror stuff. And, and, and all the stuff that you've described was in that book. Like... Hmm. 3 a.m. in the morning every night like there was supposed yep. to be sort of marching band that went through there was the pig with the glowing eyes you yep. know i mean it yeah it's like bingo it's ghost story bingo it <laughs> eyes, ghost story trope bingo grabbed um, by the throat do you, do you think uh mr bobby Mackey would let us do an overnight stay there probably well if we paid him a lot of money probably probably so um also so the other thing we I don't forgot, get asthma yeah oh no yeah. um the other thing i forgot to mention is people have encountered loud thunking sounds coming from the men's bathroom and it is hmm. one of the most haunted locations in the building i don't know why i forgot to put this in my outline but people have the been in there and the trash can has flung itself across the um room they have seen the shadow or not shadow the apparition of a man wearing what looks like a cowboy hat and has a handlebar mustache and uh, um um saying die game die game die game which is a reference to uh walling who killed pearl brian or was allegedly killed pearl brian because hmm. uh, that's the note his girlfriend sent him was die game before he was hung in march 20th okay. uh, 1897 so people think Walling haunts the building. He seems to be an entity people have reportedly seen. Um, it's it's he's kind of we know what he looks like because there's photos. Okay, him. so I know this was last week, but was he hung near the vicinity no. of the property? No, he was hung behind the courthouse in Newport. Huh. So Pearl was nowhere near the building and they did not die anywhere near the building, nor did they live near Bobby Mackey's. The Pearl okay. Bryant story is wholly separate from Bobby Mackey's. Well, However, her, they say their body, her body was found near. I thought, no, she no. was found over two miles away. Oh. She was found with, alleged tripping in the picture. Yeah. That's those, right. she okay. was found in the orchard of, um, 
Oh crap. I just forgot his name. Of course I don't have those notes on me right now, but where her body was found is where the current YMCA is located in, in Fort Thomas. Okay. She was found in Fort Thomas, Kentucky. It was a okay. Fort Thomas police that took care of her body along with the um, colonel there. Okay. So um, she is n- nowhere near Bobby Mackey's. She's miles away. Huh. Except for we don't know where her head is. So Never. It, apparently, and, uh, wasn't it thrown down the tunnel? Allegedly, according to Joanna, that's where the story comes from. That... Um, Scott and um, Jackson and Alazan. Oh, oh my goodness, it's been so long. Walling took Pearl's head and threw it down the well as a sacrifice to Lucifer. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's where that starts. <laughs> now, there is another book that I could not get my hands on because it was self published many, many years ago, and copies of it, if you can find it, are too expensive for me and uh, that would be um oh man now i've just give me a second trying to find my notebook (laughs) it was right next to me um let me find where it is This man was interviewed on Ghost Adventures. And, wrote the book. and he wrote a book. And sorry, I need to uh, find his name. Douglas Hen- Hensley. He is the author of Hell's Gate. And he wrote the book with Carl Lawson about Lawson's own experiences at Bobby Mackey's. And if you read through his book, it seems to be where a lot of the urban legends that make Jackson and Walling Satanists and tie Pearl and her case to Bobby Mackey's originate in this book. It is very... Now, this is editorialized. This is my opinion. It is from the excerpts that I've been able to read. Very... Catholic dogma fan fiction. Yeah. And um, it sounds like a supernatural episode written by someone who really loves Catholicism and the demons of it. Um, it it's where a lot of these um, stories come from, really. And if Hensley believes them. I can't say no. That's what he believes. Um, But that's where a lot of these stories are originating. And uh, I know even my friend Jeff Belanger, who was the writer for Ghost Adventures at that time for the first season, he helped write episode one. He is a paranormal historian, just like myself, and a journalist. And he does fantastic historical deep dives. If you like me, you'll love him. And he references this book in that episode. So the, going back to, one. sorry, the Hell's Gate one. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not, so I fully believe, now this is just my impression, that Ghosts of Bobby Mackey's Music World by Dan Smith was published in, as a reaction to Hell's Gate. Because mm. Dan Smith puts so much historical context into everything. Like he worked with the historical society in Claremont County and in Fort Thomas. To, 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 he did research. He did so much field work and research. Yeah. He interviewed people. He did the footwork to do this. And it kind of debunks a lot of what is in Hell's Gate. Hmm. Um, I just looked it up on Amazon and there's how much is it? <laughs> one review. It's $23 used. Uh, but it's worth to just go and read the one review about it. And the, the title says, this book is fiction, <laughs> all caps, exclamation point, And it goes on and it's basically everything we just said. Oh, that's <laughs> hilarious. Yes. So um, I guess if you want, go read the review. Um, yeah. But uh, don't dogpile on it either. Don't make an account and just make reviews up. Just 
leave it where it is. But um, I will say it, if you read a lot of the books of the time, so you're looking at the aughts through basically 2017, um, every single story, even weird Kentucky references the stories from Hell's Gate. Mm -hmm. And it is clearly the source of a lot of these stories. The first team that I ever saw on any of these paranormal shows that did not find out anything associated with this book was Ghost Hunters in 2011. Uh, they wow. spend a grand 20 minutes covering Bobby Mackey's. 20 minutes. That's wow. it. With ads. Yeah. Um, Unsolved by BuzzSeed came by in 2017 and their episode's only 20 minutes because either their writers never found Hell's Gate or they didn't reference it. And their takeaway was vastly different than Ghost Adventures and a lot of the paranormal stuff from the aughts that was much yeah. more sensationalized. And when I was saying, you can definitely see how decades and the culture around them impacted what people were finding there. So in the 70s and 80s and through the 90s, we had a very exorcist-esque version of the hauntings. Mm -hmm. Then in the aughts, when we have ghost adventures and Hell's Gate coming out, it's a very, everything's demonic, everyone's being scratched. This was the origin of people being scratched during paranormal oh, investigations. It's always in the middle of the back. It's always with three fingers every single time. <laughs> And even paranormal investigations that I was doing, people would come up scratched. And I'm like, my dude, you did this to yourself. Mm. Like, yeah. And they would not be deep scratches. They would be like, if you took your fingernails and just went really hard on your arm or on your back, that's how it always looked. And if fit the a, a handprint, basically, it'd be the mm. same space as everything and as, as somebody's hand. And this is when you started seeing this happen was in 2008 after Ghost Adventures was there. And huh. these are just habits Correct. that I saw originate here and they outgrew. And so many paranormal investigations I got called to were dealing with things that people were legitimately scared of. That started not with Bobby Mackey specifically, but that type of investigation. Yeah. And then t by 2011, 2012, it was still really hot, the paranormal. I found it fascinating that Ghost Adventures or Ghost Hunters found absolutely nothing related to Ghost Adventures. It's interesting. They it was literally nothing. <laughs> wow, and some amazing. creepy EVPs. And then just six years later, after the mad rush of paranormal stuff, when BuzzFeed Unsolved is visiting places, um, ghost hunting has had died down a lot by then. Mm -hmm. They found nothing. And it was just fascinating watching this all happen, especially as somebody who actively participated in these events. Yeah. Wow. Just like you, Jen. So yeah. that goes to my experience at Bobby Mackey's. I'm you sorry, know, I'm talking a lot. No, no, no. With all of with all of what you just said, you know, for me, I don't care if it's true or not. I just like I like going and finding out for myself, you know, and just either it's just the experience, kind of like going to a haunted house during Halloween, or it's stuff like the ghost hunts that we've been on where people take it more seriously. Yeah. You know, I, I wish I'd seen it. I've driven past it but never been inside. No. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to try to find my photos I took while I was there. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be great. I tried. I could not find any photos but one. And what was it? Glowing eyes? No, it was actually <laughs> a painted Bobby Mackey sign inside the building. And uh, I need to look at some of my other um, external hard drives to see if I save the photos. But on social media, I did not take a photo of myself. I know I took a photo of myself, but I never uploaded it. So, Oh, wow. And so you don't know where it is? I don't know where it is. So, Jen, you're right. Go to Bobby Mackey's to have a fun time. Yeah. Um, I was there for the Hell's Gate Paranormal Hoedown, September 15th, 2012, wow. from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. 
I found the original um, illustration or uh, promotional flyer that uh, I did. Um, this is when I was doing a lot of talks around the country. The same year I went to the Stanley Hotel, and I've been my there. Talks, too. That's cool. yeah, it was fun. Awesome. My talks, yeah. similar to the show, are hey, urban legends, and I went under the moniker the Urban Legends Detective because I would look up all these ghost stories and then look for historical information about them to either say this is fun, but it's folklore. Or, hey, this actually has a basis with his, with historical stuff. And here we go. Right. And like we have said with Bobby Mackey's, there is plenty of historical haunts mm -hmm. to be had there. And also a lot of folklore, which is kind of funny. Yeah, there's a lot of folklore. <laughs> so it's it's a class. This is why it's the most requested location we have talked mm -hmm. about. So I was there giving a talk about urban legends and the historical analysis of them and my goodness no one was there i was basically talking to a room full of ghosts and my manager at the time was crying because um i believe this was the last event i had through them um yeah i was not a big draw <laughs> i was not um <laughs> what but you went friends? through with it right <laughs> yeah i know my friend kim was there and that and and Paravisions, and that was it. There was no one else. And they had to be there because I think they were up next. Anyhow. <laughs> um, so I was on the stage giving my talk, doing my um, my presentation, and uh, I didn't see anything remarkable. It was the middle of the day. It was like, I think I went on at 4 p.m. So the sunlight was still coming through the main doors. And I get off the stage, and um, I, clean, I pick up my laptop and everything and I'm putting it in my laptop bag and I sit down and I'm near the, what I remember, I was in the bull room and I was just looking around and then there was, there's a doorway that's up there. And now, mind you, I feel like I live at Bobby Mackey's now because I have read <laughs> so much, but at the time I had no idea the layout of this building and there's a door and I remember seeing a young woman there who clearly was like, I want to say she was Hispanic, but she never said anything. So that's a lot of assumptions on my part. Mm -hmm. She had very dark hair and she was wearing a white dress that was um, very popular in the sixties. So what my mom used to call it was a boat neck dress so oh, it would have, yeah. yeah, it would have a boat neck, so it had a very wide neck that was um, curved, and then where it had uh, a ruching around your waist, so it would cause your the upper bit around basically your breasts to be uh, fluffy and puffed out, and then it was cinched in because of the ruching, and then it would then puff out again at your hips. And I didn't see her legs because she was blocked by the bull, but she had long hair. It clearly went to her waist, if not longer. And she, it was a short sleeve cap sleeve dress and her hair was parted in the middle and she had it tucked behind her ears and she had dark brown eyes and she just stared at me and I looked at her and my response was one, that's an awesome dress. And two, who are you? You don't fit anybody else who is here today. One, you're not wearing a black shirt and jeans. And two, which is definitely what everyone wore at the time, was their paranormal team on a black shirt with jeans. Mm -hmm. And she just stood there kind of watching everything, taking it on all in and then disappeared. And I was like, okay, so I've seen a ghost. This place is known to be haunted, so that makes sense. And at the time, I assumed it was Joanna. Huh. And okay. but she was not pregnant. This this girl, she was a very petite person, but she wasn't pregnant. And I just went, huh. Well, that's interesting. And had to go on with my day, which was an investigation of the basement. Which got cut short. 
because I had a terrible allergic reaction to all the cigarette smoke and had to be taken to the ER where they put me on a nebulizer for three hours. Oh, cat. So I'm glad there's renovations happening. I hope you guys get an air purifier. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's serious. Yeah. So uh, that's when I got my inhaler prescribed to me. (laughs) So um, Mm -hmm. I have an emergency uh, um, inhaler. But uh, wow. yeah, it was, I managed to get home um, and then Mike took one look at me and said, we're going to the ER because no. you don't look good. But yeah, so th- what I did experience was a full bodied apparition in the middle of a room at During like 4.30 p.m. Huh. with no one else around except for half a dozen people who did not see her. Wow. So I do think Bobby Mackey's is haunted, but I do not believe it's haunted by the things it's rumored to be haunted by, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. So I was there in 2013. Okay. I found my two photos that I posted oh, to Instagram, but I know I have more and I got to find those. Okay. It's, yeah. it's so interesting, just like how you've described how these ghost stories change. And just look at the looking at the experiences people give us to read for hometown haunts and stuff you don't ever see these tropes of the glowing eyes and stuff anymore right and uh it's when i was doing investigations at the time however that was a lot of the reported accounts that were happening and the glowing eyes shadow people the hat man phenomena as well but these are also tropes that we saw in the paranormal tv shows so they were reflecting themselves onto our the families calling us in and one of the things we would do was one of our first because we had a questionnaire you never see this on the tv show but what my team would do is that we would go or one of the teams i worked with i should say we would go in and we had a questionnaire and we would have an interview even before we did any ghost hunting of the people who had requested our help. And we would sit down and we would say, okay, you can tell us as much as you want or as little as you want. We will still investigate this place. But do you watch horror movies? Do you read horror um, books? Do you watch paranormal TV shows? Do you watch sci-fi shows? And we would go through and basically get an idea of what their media consumption was and what their daily schedule looked like what they did how many drinks a week they had if they took (laughs) any drugs like we wanted an money this is important because we need to know who we're dealing with influences you what influences you and that really writes how you when you have a paranormal experience how you feel it is from the culture around you and like no one was describing Bob Marley coming out with chains. No one was. But we got a <laughs> lot of hat people. We got a lot of glowing eyes mm-hmm. and growling. Um, mm. People being scratched. Toys turning on on their own. Things like that. And uh, as time went on and the paranormal shows lessened, we got fewer calls. There aren't as many people asking for paranormal investigators now. And the ones that are calling are genuinely having something they can't explain happening. Yeah. And yeah. So the entire feeling is different now. And I'm happy about that because I think paranormal shows were slightly making people paranoid about everything in the dark. Also fun fact, we didn't do our investigations in the dark. We did ours with lights on because they always did that. I did a statistical analysis back around 2013 um, of people volunteered stories to me. And the main thing was, when did this happen to you? Mm -hmm. And during the day. And people had just just as likely to run into the paranormal during the day than at night. It was a complete 50-50 divide. Um, interesting technically i think it was 51 percent versus 49 percent. 51 for daytime 49 for night 
and uh, uh, you had to discount anybody who encountered anything right before falling asleep or right before waking up mm. because oh, wow. you go into hippopotamic and hypnagogic states where your brain will just completely it can't process anything correctly it, it, dinosaurs fly on magical <laughs> rainbow wings during those times oh yeah and, i've experienced stuff like that i was yeah. gonna say i know that feeling when i'm falling asleep and working yeah um <laughs> i've had a i've had a black eyed kid encounter but it was right oh, before wow. i woke up mm -hmm. and because of that i threw it out going that was my brain and when i watch a lot of paranormal tv you see that stuff i mean the watching all the bobby mackey stuff i will say i investigate this stuff not for a living but I investigate it i know what a lot of the triggers are and i was still feeling kind of freaked out at night staring outside my window and not seeing a damn thing and going wow. something could be watching me it could be demonic ah and then yeah my other side would go no you've just watched way too much tv calm down yeah. so i don't oh like gosh. black windows don't like it you would not like the window i'm staring out of right now well i don't have in my craft room i don't have that's the only room that doesn't have a shade on there and i mainly mainly leave it open for uh my cat clover because she likes to look out the window Aww. and uh i don't i try to avoid that room at night because i don't Whenever I'm standing in a lit room and there's nothing but blackness on that other side of the window, I assume <laughs> someone's out there staring at me. Do you want to hear a scary story from when yes. I grew up in a house that was haunted? Yes. yes. Now, so, uh, let me, before we start this, um, I want to say we're at one hour and 26 minutes. So do we want to do all the haunts? We have like about half an hour worth of We content. probably shouldn't do all the haunts because it's too long. But I want to tell this story. I do it will want to leave story. everyone freaked out. And Maybe I we like should that. start your with haunts next freak. next week. Yeah, yeah. We'll start. Your your stories always freak me out. Yes. I told yes, my yes, students yes. about your one a couple of weeks ago, where your son said, "At least that man's not staring at us." And the kids visibly were scared. <laughs> oh. They were they were like, "What?" Oh my goodness! I well, love it. Coming from a child, that's even yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, well, it's for the I... cryptid assignment, and a lot of them are doing shadow people and stuff. And I told that anecdote, and they were like visibly scared by it. <laughs> I mean, it gave me goosebumps when you told me, told us, cat. I was just like, so, oh god. So let, so let <laughs> her rip. So, yeah, little, little dude will still say when I'm tucking him into bed, I'm glad Mr. Bill's not here because that's what we called the shadow person. Oh. Um. He'll just randomly say it. Um, so I know. I oh called no, him that. Mr. Bill. No, no, Mr. Bill. All right. So <laughs> spooky digress. story time. Going on open windows. Mm -hmm. So I do not usually like open windows at all. And this is why. When I grew up, I had a very haunted house I lived in. And listeners <laughs> will know that there were shadow people entities walking around pots and pans being thrown to the ground for no reason the cats were not at fault for this at all <laughs> one of the things that freaked me out would be the faces staring back at us from the windows so all around the first floor past around 9 p.m if we had not closed the curtains or the blinds people would start walking up to the windows and looking inside. They were not Whoa. alive. They were quite dead. And I would, when it was my bedtime and my mom forgot to close the windows, I would hightail it from the living room up the stairs and not look at the windows because I would see all sorts of people staring in from outside. Like this press against glass gone cat. cat. They weren't look pressed. Okay. But they were close enough to the window that I can make out their noses, their eyes, their mouths, their chins, how the fat distributed on their faces. Did they and ever come in? Hair. or They never came in. They just but stared at you. It, they just stared at us. And so, when, it, hmm? so when the window was closed, you would not see them? You, because, yeah. The, you can't see through the you curtain. You can't see out the curtain. 
Yeah. Oh. But and I I didn't. They were always outside, um, especially at night. And when I would look out my second floor bedroom window, occasionally you would see them walk around the field or well the field or eventually the actual street but um it was very unnerving i don't know who they were did you ever see them during the day nope that's just what i was going only ask. at night only post 9 p.m oh, that's yeah. weird and i was They're wide awake at the all time all night all night um i or at least until you fell asleep at, at least till i fell asleep and i would wake up occasionally to look out the window and I don't recall seeing them, but they just were attracted to our house. And there had to be about 12 people of all ages. Same ones every time. To, yeah, that's what I was just going to ask. Yeah, was they were the repeated. I remember seeing the same woman's face. It was um, very round. She was an older woman because she had a lot of wrinkles. She had gigantic cheeks and a chubby chin. And her lips were kind of... They weren't full. They were rather flat. And then she had a rather round nose and thick eyebrows and um, kind of, it, it was just dark hair. I do not believe they were Native American before everyone goes, you were seeing Native American ghosts. No, I think they were a, um, early set, white settlers of the area that were, because we had family cemeteries dotted yeah. in a lot of these farms yeah. and a lot of these farms were purchased and then turned into residential neighborhood mm. and those families didn't always get the, all the bodies moved i think and uh yeah so i don't do know who ever, they were do, do you Please ever have that happen that. now i i've not had that happen now um, not in Could a long you? time. I think the last time that happened was when I was living in Japan and I had a shadow come up to my window and I opened the window and no one was there. And this was around 5 p.m. on a Saturday on the second floor of my host family's house. Mm -mm. Wow. Mm -mm. And it wasn't my host mom. So uh, that what was would be weird. even worse than that is if you would see the face come through the goddamn curtain. Yeah, that never happened. It, it seemed to be the actual house <laughs> barrier. They just did not come in. See, bl the blankets do protect you. <laughs> sure. Well, so, so was there, the pink was ones there, especially. Was there an incident that made that stop happening? Like, what? I moved. <laughs> well, I was just, you know, wondering if you Do you know how freaked out I was in 2021 when I had to clean up that house by myself during the height of COVID and there oh were God. no curtains anywhere? Chewy and I were alone in that house. We would camp out on the second floor. As soon as the sun set, we did not go back downstairs. Wow. Now, did you see them when you were cleaning out the house? Uh, Yeah. <laughs> So you saw them again. So they were yes. still there. So they were still like, there. Yeah. And they were well, like, hey, it's her. So they remembered you. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a feeling they were always there though. Looking yeah, in. Yeah, they were always there looking in. And uh and they um, never said anything? No, they would never said anything. It was that's what also what made them very creepy because they never said anything. Usually I can pick up on vibes of ghosts mm -hmm. or, or like nothing. It was like a void. It was like static, actually. And Chewy hated going outside at night. He would oh, yeah? he would literally, when we had to do business time, I would open the front door and I'd go, okay, go get busy. He would run, do everything very quickly, and then beeline it back to the house. <laughs> and he, he hated being out there. And I maybe he was picking up on me hating being up there. Yeah. But um, he did that. He was efficient. He was a super efficient guy <laughs> during that so, time. So did anyone else, like, did you ever take friends that were sensitive there? Were you the only person at that house that saw them? Or do you think your um, mom saw anything? I, I have suspicions my mom saw them from time to time. Because man, oh man, um, if she forgot to do the curtains, she would suddenly start fussing around the house, making sure all of them were down very quickly. And it was my huh. dad who was just like, what are you doing? Like, 
What? Is it, no one lives around dead people. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So, um, I don't care if I live on the middle of nowhere in a glass house, I'm having curtains that close at night. Yes. It's it's a smart (laughs) safety thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, personally, like here in the house I live in now, every single one of my windows is open. Mm -hmm. It's now 8 40, 54 PM. And I'm fine. I don't feel like things are coming up to my window to look at me am i waiting for a mountain lion to come up yes but (laughs) that's tangible i i get a very happy feeling on this property i don't get the glumness that was on that on the property i grew up on but all right so our celebration is going to carry on into a third week um this one will be only talking about and reading your ghost stories yes so if you like the story that i just told and have your own to share you can email us at hometown haunted mail at gmail.com also don't forget to join our facebook group hometown haunts and you can follow us at <coughs> i'm sorry i didn't mute myself you can find us at cincy cabinet of curiosities on instagram and also I do Corpse Flower Press. You can find all that information on Instagram as well. Christina, you have a bunch of stuff happening, like the Romania trip. Yes, yes. You have an art show. Where can they follow you? uh, Well, they can follow my Instagram, uh, Christina Wald underscore art. And my show lasts till March 22nd. And I have another show coming up in May that's going to be with Jim Effler and C.F. Payne. And I've got... What else is happening? I'm forgetting <laughs> stuff, but I'll just reveal as there's more stuff happening, but there's we'll more reveal. stuff. Happening. It'll be That's always reveal. good. Yes. <laughs> It'll be a slow reveal, but yes. um, excellent. We'll s- see everybody next time. Yes. Yes. So for Christina, Jen, and myself, thank you for being a listener of Hometown Haunts. Thank you for helping us make it to 100 Ooh, episodes plus yippee. now. And we'll see you next week. Stay spooky. Bye bye.